Tēnā koutou rauranga te ramai, nau mai hara mai ki runga tēnei te uenoa, o kui koro mā ko te aro tēnei e mihi nei, ki a koutou e hie. Tēnā tātou, nau mai ara mai ki runga tēnei te uenoa, o kui koro mā ko te aro te ingoa o te uenoa nei, tēnei te mi i atu ki a koutou. I tēnei ata. Welcome. Um, welcome from, from my people who are based here in Te Onganui Atara in Wellington. Um, and welcome also from my colleagues, um, Ariana, one of our uh, wa'ini pūrotu from down in, uh, in uh, Te Waipaunamu in uh, Ngai Tahu, but also uh, here representing uh, her role in National Library and Alexander Turnbull Library. And my, my kotimana friend, my Scottish friend, uh, uh, Claire Hall, who uh, is here uh, speaking on behalf of Te Reo Taranaki. Uh, what, what we wanted to speak to you today about is a project that the three of us have been working on um, since 2012. Um, but I did also, um, and that's the, the digitisation of a set of letters that are, are in the Alexander Turnbull Library. Um, and we'll talk, all of us will talk in more detail about our experience in working on this particular project. Um, I, did I did want to start by giving a little bit of a background and a whakapapa to um, how this project came about uh, from the perspective of um, the iwi. Um, and from my perspective, both as, as an archivist and an iwi member, and also a member, um, while I'm not paid by Te Reo Taranaki, of the, the project that Te Reo Taranaki is running. So I want to go back 10 years and talk very briefly about um, when Ruakere Hond and Makere Edwards came to present at the National Digital Forum uh, in 2007, um, and their vision for a indigenous uh, digital archive that would, that would safeguard uh, in digital format the, um, the language of Taranaki, Te Reo Taranaki. Te Reo Taranaki is a small charitable trust looking at language revitalization in, in Taranaki. Um, if anybody knows the history of this area, Wellington, we, uh, we settled here from Taranaki and we maintained those links over the last 200 years. So we're very much still linked to Taranaki. Um, so uh, while we, we look to our maunga here, um, Matairangi and Ahumairangi, um, we also look to maunga Taranaki as being our, our forebear, our, our tupuna. Um, so Makere and Ruakere had this vision. They, had, um, they, they went with this vision to DIA and as part of the um, National Digital Strategy at the time, they got funding for this project to Putiro Tiriata. Um, and it was, it was the, what they said at that time, what they saw this as being was um, they were going to base it on the, uh, the Kite Horo Whenua software. Um, the, so, so it was Kite Taranaki Reo. Um, and it was that it needed to have permission levels that would allow access and restriction based on what people wanted to happen with their collections. Uh, it would have an online dictionary. Um, it would include the Māori subject headings. That was an important part of the work was to, to build in the Māori subject headings. Um, and it was mainly um, at, at that particular time to focus on audio files. Um, They, uh, they, they, we, they got this project going and they brought me on and not long after I started they brought Claire on as our project manager. So we've been working on this project from uh, quite early on. Um, and I think five years ago, uh, Claire and I presented at NDF about um, using the Kete software and I think that one of the things that we spoke about at that talk was um, just that, we, that our vision for how this could work and um, the way that Kete worked weren't quite working together. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more, um, Claire's going to talk a little bit more about um, how we've moved on from that discussion. But it gave us a really good basis for starting to think about how we worked with data, um, uh, how we wanted to organise our metadata, um, 
and uh, from that point on, um, uh, that began the sort of the development of um, of uh, the Putero Tiriata project, and then out of that developed a number of relationships that meant that we could. Uh, then start to work with institutions about finding our knowledge. So we had two main goals. One was creating, um, creating digital records that reflected our community and looking in our community for records that we could digitise, but also going into national collections and regional connection, collections and looking for our material where it had been recorded elsewhere. And we've, we did a project with Archives New Zealand identifying material held there. Um, and, uh, then, and we uh, have also looked through a number of other collections, but I think, um, and what we're going to talk about today, is um, where we got to in terms of, um, of this project that we are going to focus on. So um, we've, we're looking at it from two directions. One, the software that we're using to manage the collections and to the uh, content that is being created as part of this, uh, as this project that we're going to talk about today. So I want to talk a little bit, and um, Ariana and Claire are going to talk from their perspectives, but I want to talk about, uh, from my perspective as an iwi person, about the Letters Project Evolution. So we had done some work with um, National Library already identifying records. We'd run this, this exhibition here, um, talking about letters from our tūpuna that had been found in various places, including the Alexander Turnbull Library. Um, and then in 2012, I was at a talk um, at, it was actually held at Archives New Zealand, but it was an ARANS talk, where um, Paul Diamond um, and Ariana got up and spoke about a couple of projects that they were working on. And uh, for me, as an iwi person sitting in the audience, to know that I had these two good friends and colleagues who stood up to talk about Taranaki, uh, their, their work on Taranaki projects, and, and I didn't know anything about it. And, and I, I felt quite... I felt quite hurt that, that I hadn't been spoken to about these fantastic projects that they were doing, um, considering my, my connections with um, Taranaki, with Te Reo Taranaki, um, and, and with these tūpuna who they were talking about. Um, funnily enough, one of them the, that uh, Paul was talking about was a picture of Honiana Tupuni, um, who, of, of course, I'm named for. Um, so... After they spoke about these projects, I approached them and, and said to them, you know, I'd really like to understand a little bit more about how you're working with iwi in these projects, because I thought, if, if I didn't know, do the rest of the iwi know what's going on? And um, it, it became quite clear that that conversation hadn't happened. So I felt like it was my responsibility to, to, and, and to help them be in a safe space about actually working on these collections. And so um, I said to them, well, look, let's, let's find how we can facilitate the conversation with iwi. And so from there has sprung this relationship around these letters. Now, these, the, this particular collection of letters um, is a collection that was taken in um, the 18, during the Taranaki Wars in the 1860s uh, when Pa were um, invaded, um, when they were sacked. If there was any correspondence that was found, the they, um, soldiers took it to read it for intelligence. And um, so it's one of those few collections of Māori letters that is from Māori to Māori. So you hear quite a different voice. A lot of the writing is Māori writing to Crown, and they'll write quite, they won't use necessarily the level of metaphoric language that you would use if you were speaking directly to somebody who had a native understanding of the language. So from, from a language perspective, it was a really important collection to us. From a tūpuna um, perspective, it was a really important collection for us. And from the perspective that it was stolen from our pa, it was a really important collection to us in Taranaki. So forming those relationships and making sure that 
the, our, the collection was well cared for. We knew that it physically was well cared for, but as my, um, one of my unonga um, has said on a number of occasions, it is an institution's job to care, to care for the physical well-being of collections. It is the people's job, the iwi job, to care for the spiritual and cultural well-being of collections. And that's why connection between uh, institutions and iwi and, and source communities is so critical to making collections work well. Um, so... 2012, we started to form these, this relationship and Te Reo Taranaki was brought into the fold because I was involved with Te Reo Taranaki as a broker to, to help facilitate these relationships. Iwi, um, in 2012, um, we're still, in, particularly in Taranaki, we're in a position of um, being in the middle of treaty settlement. And in treaty settlement, um, there are other focuses and I think one of the other things that I've learnt uh, in working with Iwi and that I think my colleagues um, have also um, become very familiar with is, the, is that you can't make anything happen in Te Ao Māori until it's the right time for it to happen. And 2012 was not the right time for this project to happen because our Iwi weren't ready to engage with the project. Um, so we over the last... Um, uh, five years, uh, Arianna and Claire have been slowly working away at Iwi, getting things ready for this project to flower. And what we're here to talk about today is a little bit about how this uh, project has, has grown and flowered into something that I think is a, a, a really good template for uh, a way to work with Iwi Collections um, and uh, to work with, with iwi in terms of the repatriation, and in this case, digital repatriation of these taonga. Um, I just wanted to very briefly talk about kaitiakitanga, and I think what underlying everything I've said is the idea of kaitiakitanga, and that was, and for me, that summed up in uh, what Hemi spoke about when he said um, that we care for the cultural and spiritual um, well-being of collections. Uh, I think that it's, it's really important for me. I don't talk about myself as a kaitiaki. As a, as a, I'm also um, a, a, a strate the strategic advisor Māori at Ngā Taonga Sound and Vision. I don't talk about myself and my role there as being a kaitiaki. I talk about myself as being a kaipupuri. I'm there to hold and care for the collections. Uh, but the kaitiakitanga belongs with the, with the iwi, with the source communities of those collections. Um, so for me, the understanding of kaitiakitanga um, and the matauranga that sits within kaitiakitanga um, is something that belongs with iwi and I think that as you'll hear through my, when my, uh, my mates here talk further about the project that um, they, uh, they will talk in much more detail about how that journey can be tied together so how you bring together kaitiaki, kaipupuri and of course in, in this relationship um, the, the broker, the uh, uh, Kaitaka Wainga, the, the person who, who walks between um, the iwi and the institution. Um, often the Kaitaka Wainga um, would be somebody like uh, from the institution, but in this case we were lucky enough to have Te Reo Taranaki who was passionate about the Reo, passionate about its support for the Taranaki community and were able to broker that relationship through. Um, I just want to, I'm going to hand over in a minute to, um, to Ariana to talk about uh, her journey uh, in, in representing um, National Library. And before I leave, I, I'm very sorry, but I, I am going to have to leave because um, I'm supposed to be in Raitahi talking to the iwi up there about uh, some of their taonga. Um, so I'm going to leave here and jump on a car and drive there. Um, but before I go, I did want to um, to Mi'i, to um, to uh, Paul and to Ariana and um, particularly to to Claire for their continued support of me and for allowing this space for me to talk a, li a little bit about um, 
what it is to be on the iwi side of things. I'm often talking uh, on behalf of organisations. Um, it, it's nice to um, stand here as an iwi member. Nō reira, tēnei te mi atu ki a koutou. Kia ora koutou, ko kaitahu te iwi, ko kāti e rekehu te hapu, ko Ariana te kawahau, he mihi nui kia koutou. I started working at the Alexander Turnbull at the end of 2011 as the Māori specialist in the arrangement and description team, and my team processes um, the new collections uh, in the unpublished area, and we also, when needed, uh, enhance older collections. And one of my first jobs was working on these letters, and um, it's a quite a large collection, uh, 252 Māori letters, and it had been selected uh, to be digitised. It's now known as the Atkinson Māori Letters uh, Collection from Taranaki, but initially came into the library in 1961 as part of the Polynesian Society records. In 1983, our first uh, Māori manuscripts librarian, Sharon Dell, uh, identified these letters as one of our jewels. And one of the reasons for that was uh, what Honiana was saying, that, it's, that the letters are between Māori tipuna and not Māori crown agents or missionaries. Um, so it's quite special in terms of the, the letters within our public institutions. And because they were seen as special, they were separated out from the Polynesian Society records and arranged in date order and put within um, 18 folders, just like um, these letters here from one of our folders. And in line at that time in the 1980s with other manuscripts, collections, um, in, an inventory was created as a finding aid and made available in the library reading room. And around that time, the collection was also microfilmed. When our first uh, computerised database, Tapuhi, was created in the early 1990s, the detailed information from the inventory wasn't actually transferred into that system. So all you could see on the database was um, you know, the collection level record, and then it would go down to the folder level, and it would say correspondence and the dates of date ranges of those letters. The inventory actually included dates and names of the ancestors who wrote the letters and who they wrote to, and listed relevant places where known. Both the inventory and the collection record uh, also explained some of the historical context of the letters, and it said that the majority of them were taken from two kāinga, Paiaka Mahoe and Mātai Tawa, when they were destroyed in the Taranaki Wars in the 1860s. That's, a, that's the front of the inventory, and it's a bit of a, an artefact in itself these days. This article from Papers Past was published in April 1864. And this excerpt of it reads, Major Atkinson and the Bush Rangers now crossed the Whangatahua to destroy Payaka Mahoe, which, though a large place, was not fortified. The crops here also had been mainly taken away, but some kumaras which had been dug and heaped were brought away by the men, the natives having kindly provided and left kits for the purpose. Other things were destroyed and the whares burnt. An interesting collection of letters was found here and have been shown to us, including a noteworthy letter of William King's of February last year, which we hope to publish shortly. So as Honiana explained, they were used for military intelligence and passed into the hands of Arthur Samuel Atkinson, who worked as an editor for the Taranaki Herald at that time. His biography describes him as a philologist, and apparently philology is the study of language in oral and historical written sources, and combines literary criticism, history, and linguistics. Some of the letters were later published and um, translated 
in the Taranaki Herald under the heading of Māori Literature. The work Atkinson did on the letters is probably why the collection was named after him when it was separated from the Polynesian Society papers. He was also a founding member of the Polynesian Society, an active player in the wars as a member of the Taranaki Volunteer uh, Rifle Corps. And the Major Atkinson mentioned in the paper's past article was Arthur's brother, Harry. And this is a photo of some of the um, Atkinson family, including um, Arthur holding the baby and, and Harry sitting down on the step there. So in April 2012, my colleagues and I spoke at an Aryan symposium, which uh, Honiana talked about earlier. So uh, Paul Diamond, uh, our Māori curator, spoke about a collection of Māori portraits that he was researching for an exhibition, and I spoke about the project that I had started on. So I spoke about the description enhancement work, and uh, the work that I was doing involved creating a record for each of the letters and adding in the information from the inventory, uh, such as the names and places and dates into Tapuhi. And I also added in iwi names where uh, I could tell through uh, maps. And one map that I found in particular that was useful was through uh, a, a digitized thesis that had been created in 2001 uh, written by Penelope Good, and um, there was a map that showed some of the uh, Kainga and Pa sites. So this work created uh, many more access points for researchers, and the aim was to make them more discoverable. And the plan at that stage was to create, um, or to digitise all of the letters and uh, attach them to those individual records. So, yeah, the symposium talk seemed to go well at the time, um, but then a few weeks later, after that symposium, we were approached by Honiana, an experienced archivist who at that time worked for Te Reo Taranaki. Honiana had concerns about us speaking about the Taranaki letters, as well as the portraits containing an image of her tipuna namesake, Honiana Tipuni and speaking in a public forum without considering speaking to her or, the, her or the iwi first. She had spoken to some of her advisors in the community and they had suggested a way forward. And at first, after expressing her concerns, it was an uncomfortable space for us all to be in for a while. But we worked through it and agreed it would be beneficial to work on a more collaborative approach. And um, in Pia's keynote speech the other uh, yesterday, uh, she spoke about um, spaces of discomfort and how that that's actually can be a good thing. And I think it was in this case. So Paul and I next met with Honiana and Hemi Sundgren, who's pictured up here. And Hemi's a tribal historian who was involved with Te Reo Taranaki and is currently the chief executive of Te Kotahitanga or Te Atiawa. At that time, Honiana said to the, uh, to the whānau of Taranaki, the history associated uh, with the Taranaki Wars was not something in the distant past, but it was as, as though it happened yesterday. And this, in essence, uh, is what we need to keep in mind when we're looking after indigenous collections which carry a painful history such as this one. In Māori society, there's an onus on descendants to protect taonga in a spiritual sense, and also to try to enhance the mana of iwi. There is also a duty to prevent harm or diminishment of the mana of your iwi, hapu or whānau. And by approaching us and offering, us, offering to introduce us to iwi, uh, Honiana was offering us a gift, a chance to rebalance the mana in the relationship. So since then, um, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, our friend and colleague, um, Paul Diamond, who has done a lot of this mahi, uh, we've been developing a relationship with Taranaki Iwi and Te Atiawa, who are the two principal iwi relating to the letters based on location of those two kāinga. When we exhibited one of the letters in an exhibition in the Turnbull Gallery 
Hemi co-wrote a label with me which gave an iwi perspective of the kōrero uh, relating to Wirimu Te Rangitake and the beginning of the Taranaki War. And this is the same William King mentioned in the paper's past article. Um, so that's a copy of the, the label that we co-wrote. Later in 2012, Paul and I went to New Plymouth to meet Kanohi Kite Kanohi or face to face with Te Reo o Taranaki. We took digital copies of the letters uh, to them and spoke alongside Honiana at a public event at Pokiariki, which aligned with an exhibition that Te Reo o Taranaki curated. When we met with Te Reo o Taranaki, they made it clear that they could not speak on behalf of Iwi so we still needed to find a way to engage with iwi. We soon realised, however, that the timing was not great for them as they were in the midst of their treaty claims. And also the content of the letters was still a mystery to them at that stage, so it was difficult to progress. For these reasons, once the letters were digitised and added to their new records, we decided to make the digital copies available only in the reading room uh, meaning that they have the same level of access as the microfilms and the physical letters. Meanwhile, work to connect the letters with iwi has been progressing, which I will leave uh, to Claire to talk about. Before I hand over, though, I'd like to emphasise some of the lessons that we've learnt um, about or through this project. Firstly, to use any challenges that we get from Māori communities as an opportunity for engagement. And that engagement with Māori is seldom straightforward. A one-size-fits-all approach is never the answer. Progress does not always happen according to our institutional timeframes, and our desired outcomes at the beginning of a project may not align with the right outcomes for our kaitiaki communities. So we need to enter into these relationships with open minds and hearts. Me ata haere tātou i te ngākau mahaki. Kia ora. Mauri ora ki runga, mauri ora ki raro, mauri ora wanginui a tātou katoa i ui ui mai i tēnei rangi mokopuna, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, kia ora, thank you Ariana, also Honiana in her absence. Um, I think you probably got a bit of a sense now of the incredible team that I'm working with, the incredible, incredible privilege that we've had over the last five years to be working together on this. Um, and I want to echo Ariana and um, Honiana's uh, mihi to our colleague and friend Paul Diamond. Um, by rights, he should be up here with us. Kia ora powder. Um, I just want to start uh, using all his guinea pigs in a way. Um, I'm going to read a, a traditional knowledge statement um, that we've drafted for this presentation. Um, and I'll come back to that later in the talk. So just uh, have a listen and tuck it away in the back of your mind. Um, so I just want to indicate that the um, mātauranga, the, the material that we're talking about today, is, not, is traditionally not publicly available. Um, and this statement is correcting a misunderstanding about the circulation options for this material. It's letting you know that while this material may be referenced under a traditional knowledge outreach licence in the context of this presentation, the traditional owners, Te Atiawa and Taranaki Iwi, ask that you respect that uh, the most appropriate designated circulation conditions for this mātauranga are actively being considered by the traditional kaitiaki alongside the physical kaitiaki of the letters, the Alexander Turnbull Library. Um, so I'll come back to that a bit later on. So Hornian has touched on um, how digitisation and digital repatriation uh, have been really critical in Te Reo Taranaki's language revitalisation strategy. Uh, so in this context, I'm talking today about how we've been using the um, Mukuru Indigenous Knowledge Management Platform to bring home digital heritage mātauranga from other collections for research and education efforts. Um, Honiana mentioned the two-year uh, project that we did with Archives New Zealand quite early on in um, the life of Te Putero Tereata, that's the Taranaki Māori Archive, uh, and that preceded this project. That was a really vital project. It gave us a lot of experience to draw on when we started working with the Alexander Turnbull on this kaupapa. Um, 
so we didn't go into it inexperienced, uh, but you know the question that is quite regularly posed about this question is about this kaupapa, is why is it taken so long? Um, Ariana emphasised that uh, five years is a really long stretch in an institutional lifespan for a project. So I just want to address that very briefly. Um, five years might sound like a long time, but I really want you to consider that from um, the angle of um, these letters have been alienated from their descendants for more than 150 years. Uh, if you think about it in that regard, I think we're actually doing quite well. And as Honiana said, the letters will come home when they're ready. Our job is to make sure that that can happen in a smooth fashion. Kanga tupuna ngā whakaro. So let's flash back five years, uh, back to the Taranaki Reo Taranaki Tangati exhibition that Honiana and Ariana have referenced. Um, that was quite a big deal for Te Reo Taranaki, uh, especially having three rock stars like Paul and Ariana and Honiana come to town. <laughs> so uh, understandably the media were interested. So uh, we pre-arranged an interview with the local paper and I think Paul probably spoke to the reporter and on the day of the, the talk, on the day of that meeting where we were getting together to discuss the, the, how we'd approach the project, this was the article that was published. I don't know if it qualifies as fake news, um, but certainly uh, it, it wasn't quite right. So the main uh, message in this article was that the Atkinson letters will be available online soon. Uh, what actually happened in that meeting is we managed to agree on one point and one point alone, and there's about 15 that we identified that we had to keep working on. So the one thing that we managed to agree on was that we were talking about a digital repatriation project with particular objectives. And that was, the, <laughs> that was actually what the um, article should have said. But in effect, that, uh, that meeting raised many, many more questions than it answered. And it was my job over the next five years to try and um, answer them. So five years ago, a little bit of historical context, Honiana's mentioned that the iwi were in the thick of their treaty settlement work. There, there just wasn't time or space to consider this collection in the way that it needed to be considered. At Te Reo Taranaki, um, we'd just broken up with Kete. Um, we had no Taonga database really to speak of. Uh, and, and in many ways, we have to be grateful for uh, what uh, the Kiti prototype gave us. It showed us what wouldn't work with Matauranga Māori management. Um, but we'd, we'd invested uh, quite a lot of time and quite a lot of energy into that, um, which is a really big thing for a very small charitable trust on a very, very lean budget. We're talking about the smell of a smell of an oily rag. We're not talking about an oily rag. Um, so... We were a little tender, and I, and I was a little hesitant to really rush into anything. Uh, I hadn't even heard of Mukadu then, although um, it, it was emerging uh, in the United States out of Washington State University. And it was later on that year that uh, I went to Kim Christian and Michael Ashley's talk at the Auckland Museum. And um, just, just as fate would have it, uh, that ended up being the, um, the solution that we went with. So I, I guess... Five years has gone very quickly, um, but it's really only been in, in the last two to three months that Te Atiawa and Taranaki have been in position to sit around a table with us with the letters and actually talk about where we go from here. Um, I guess one of the things I really want to emphasise in terms of the time that this has taken is that the relation aspects of this kaupapa are so critical. I think that the fact that uh, Paul and Ariana, Honiana and I have uh, been able to stay on this continuously for that time that we, we have uh, made the gains that we have. And, and that relationship uh, uh, is, is so important to the trust and the hononga that come out of uh, work like this. Um, yeah, particularly the kanohi ki te kanohi, and, and we've been really, really grateful uh, for the efforts that Paul and Ariana have put into coming to Taranaki. That has been a really big thing, for certainly for the iwi. It's been an expression of, of faith. Um, so I, my role hasn't been about critical engagement with the letters in terms of the content, in terms of the writing. It's been about finding and testing the workflows, finding funding, finding the right people to do the transcriptions. And in those lean times... Uh, when the oily rag wasn't smelling so great, um, really just ensuring that the project stayed on the radar. 
It's also been about laying the technical groundwork so that the critical engagement can take place with the traditional owners. Um, Anana's comment about needing time to consider the historical context and the content of the letters before any decisions about access could be made is, is a really, really relevant one. Um, I, I draw on uh, the work of uh, Kim Christian, who is one of the co-developers of, of the Mukutu software that we've been using. And, and the evolution of Mukutu was, was, yes, certainly about open access, but perhaps more importantly, it was how do we deal with the information that doesn't want to be free? When, as our kaumatua said yesterday, uh, not all memories are for everyone when going through a negotiated process might in fact lead to more complex uh, stipulations around access than currently exist. And, and how do institutions respond to that? How do your institutions respond to that? Um, there has been a lot of evolution in that space. Uh, the the Kōrero Kitea report that came out of um, uh, Alexander Turnbull that Ariana and Paul co-authored I thought that was, a, that was a step in the right direction. That was particularly looking at the uh, end use of digitised te reo collections. That was a really great piece of work. But when it came to the access section, I thought there was quite a big gap there. Um, it was still predominantly premised on the expectation of negotiated open access, of what's best from an institutional perspective. So I'm suggesting we need to shift that thinking even further and talk openly about how we deal with the fact that some of the information in your collections, it's not appropriate for it to be open. Um, who's familiar with Mukuru? Just, okay, there's a few hands up. That's good, great. Um, I will just give you a very, for those of you who aren't familiar, I'll just give you a very brief background on it because I think it's kind of important as to why we chose it. So it's a long-running uh, grassroots project which aims to empower communities to manage, share, preserve and exchange their digital heritage in culturally, re culturally relevant and ethically minded ways. Uh, its relationship with Aotearoa spans the last few years. We've been really active in, in trying to create engagement in Aotearoa for Mukuru. Um, it's really easy to use. I'm not a technical person at all, and I've found it incredibly easy to pick up. It's worked really well for the Matauranga work that we're doing. Um, it's Drupal-based, and we're using it largely as a content management system for Te Putero Te Reata. It's uh, uh, aroha mai, sorry for my pronunciation here, uh, warumangu, an Australian Aboriginal word which means safekeeping safe place. Um, and it's been designed alongside traditional knowledge holders um, to enable that appropriate sharing. So it's great, but I really want to emphasise that Muktu is not, at its foundations, a Mātauranga Māori knowledge management platform. It's a really good intermediary, as uh, Honiana said, a really good um, taki wainga. It's, it's a good middle ground, but at its bones, it's not Māori. And, and this is really important, and this is something that my um, great friend Honiana is really, really hot on. It's either Māori or it's not. <laughs> um, because uh, indigenous knowledge, Mātauranga, resides within a quite a different knowledge base altogether for traditional um, academic disciplines. And Linda Tuhiwai Smith has done some really excellent uh, thinking and writing around this, particularly around how the methodologies that we use to get to the point of processing, to get to the point of engagement, are just as important as the end result. So while we really love the idea of creating our own bespoke database, we just simply didn't have the cash. But isn't it a great idea? <laughs> um, so we went with Mukuru because it's indigenous knowledge management principled uh, and, and relatively inexpensive. Um, so we, we worked with um, Michael Ashley um, out of San Francisco, the Centre of Digital Archaeology, to adapt the very vanilla, the very fresh from GitHub Mukuru system to suit what we were doing. And we've done a lot of work with them over the last two and a half years, some of which I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Um, Okay, so th this is a, a screen of, of the database, just showing you how the, how the letters have been imported and how they, how they present in the database. I'll talk about them a little more in a moment. Uh, so we started building on the ATL's efforts to digitise the material. Uh, we started adding um, 
a little bit more metadata. Um, we did transcriptions of the letters. Uh, we looked out for um, new words. We were coming at this from a language revitalisation perspective. You have to bear that in mind. And actually the funding that we got to do this work after a couple of turndowns from the cultural heritage sector, I won't name any names, um, was uh, actually from a Matereo grant from Te Fiti. So we had some success in getting traction on this as a language project rather than a cultural heritage project. Um, we had the digitised um, letters on the exhibition floor during those uh, shows that we talked about, but it was, it was just too public. There was no way that whānau were going to come in and reconnect for the first time with these taonga in such a public space. So it was on the basis of that feedback that we started this work. Um, I want to mihi to the two uh, Taranaki researchers that worked with us on this project, so that's uh, Tanya Hodges-Paul, who's the Archive Coordinator at Te Putero Tariata, and Taumairangi Marsh, who's also from Taranaki. So they had the job of identifying uh, 70 letters that we'd work with in the pilot set, splitting them into three sets. So those three sets were uh, letters relating to uh, Te Atiawa, letters relating to Taranaki, and a third, more generic set that we felt quite safe to put in, in a public space uh, to be able to demonstrate the way that they were going into the database, what we were doing with them. Um, how am I going for time? Oh, hi. Okay. Um, I, I just want to uh, draw on some of the uh, kōrero of Tanya, who was working with the letters. She was doing the transcriptions. Uh, so Tanya said, it's impossible to consider these letters without feeling the mamai, without the pōritanga and tomaha. That's the sadness, the heaviness. And, and kind of the intensity of the events that take pl took place through the 1850s and 1860s. And she mentioned there that uh, they, when they were working with these, they were always using karakia. They were always making sure that they were using tikanga to keep themselves safe through this process. I think Tanya's touching on a really, really important aspect of this project that, that um, we must consider. And that's the homecoming aspect, to waka hokinga ki te kainga. Um, how the reconciliation and, re and reconnection process can be one of healing, one of affirmation uh, for the descendants of these letters. Ngai Morahu, the survivors of those Tupuna writers uh, confronted by the war, the dispossession, the loss of language, the loss of culture. Um, those of you, uh, some of you might be aware of the uh, Pariaka apology that happened recently, the Puanga Hayata, the Crown apology to Pariaka for the sacking of the pa. And, and I'm not at all likening um, what we're doing to that, but it does have an element of that. Um, it has to be genuine. The terms of the reconciliation of the waka hokinga must be genuine, and they also must be set by those who have inherited the mamai, the pauritanga, and the taumaha. Um, so very briefly, I just want to return to, um, just give you another couple of views here. So uh, imported the letter, we've imported the transcription, what Mukatu allows us to do is to apply traditional knowledge labels. It also likes, allows us to share rights, particular rights. So within the database, we acknowledge the physical kaitiaki or kaipupuritanga of the uh, Alexander Turnbull, but we are also able to assign the, I guess, intellectual property, the sweat of the brow of te reo taranaki in the transcriptions, as well as acknowledging the traditional owners through a traditional knowledge license. I'm really excited by these traditional knowledge licences that we're applying in Mukatu. I think that there is enormous scope for us to apply them here in Aotearoa. I know that, um, I believe the Creative Commons licences have been uh, translated literally but not conceptually into Te Reo, and I suggest that these traditional knowledge licences are an excellent starting point for us to think about how we might do that within institutions. Uh, aye, so koira taku. <laughs> um, yeah, much, much more I could talk about. Uh, so thank you, everybody. I guess, um, you know, very much like Pia's talk yesterday, more than anything, what I want to leave you with is, is rather the fear, rather than being feeling confronted by those uncomfortable spaces, as Ariana says, do grab them. Um, be really inspired by the potential that they create and, and what can come out of them. Nei rā taku mihi anō ki a koutou. Munga munga noi ho te hiriwa me te koura I te kuru kuru tanga o tā kura kura e hai Kia ora. <laughs>